Hi, David Moore with Equity Advantage, 1031exchange.com, and I've got Tina Colson from our firm here with me today, and she's going to be testing Tina. So you got some questions for me, I understand. <laughs> I'm testing David. Yes. So I'd like to talk about REITs, TICs, and DSTs. Um, we can facilitate the purchase of these investments through our 1031 exchange. Um, can you talk briefly about the difference between each investment uh, and why someone would choose this option over going out and purchasing a single family residence or multifamily? Sure. sure, great question. Typically, we look at all three of those things sort of as end games. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if pe- people that are, you know, well, uh, honestly, right now during these times, we've got lots of people that are very tired of their politicians, very tired of tenants and everything else. So I was going to say, typically, it's, it's from my mom. She doesn't want to deal with a tenant. She doesn't want to have to manage a property and deal with all the heartache that goes along with that. But at the end of the day, if she sells one of those rental houses, she doesn't want to have to pay the tax, right? So where can she go and, and, and maintain the benefits of real estate ownership mm-hmm. without having to deal with maybe, the, you know, the, the headaches of ownership, too. The terrible sure. T's, toilets, trash, tenants, turnover. Tina as wasn't long, one of those. I was just going to say, yeah. don't add Tina in exactly. there. Exactly. <laughs> so, so the deal is, if you look at, at, at ways to buy, in effect, a mm-hmm. passive piece of real estate, if, if we were talking from our IRA Advantage perspective, we'd sure. be talking about REITs, right? A real estate investment trust. Right. And, and a REIT, you know, that's sort of Wall Street's solution to uh, an investor with a retirement account. Let's go buy real estate, right? Hey, let's go buy that real estate investment trust. Well, that works fine for the Wall Street world. But if you want to go buy real estate with money out of your pocket, um, is that really what you want? I mean, it's a stock. So it doesn't really give you the benefits of ownership of a piece of property, the interest deduction, depreciation, all that stuff. Where a DST, Delaware Statutory Trust, or a tenancy in common investment will. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, TICs and DSTs are easily exchanged into REITs typically or not. There are exceptions called up REITs. So you you basically exchange an asset they want to absorb and you can get into it, which you can get into that thing, but after you're in, there's no way out. So typically, I'm not a fan of up REITs. Uh, everything's got an opportunity, a place that is right, but typically I'm against those. Uh, on the other hand, tenancy in common and DST, those are where most of our people go. And, and during the last crash, here we are in the time of COVID, so we're dealing with some real issues once again. Right. But if we look back at the last crash and we start looking at things that were sort of casualties of that, I, I would say the tenancy and common offerings, institutionalized tenancy and common offerings were sort of a casualty of that time. And it wasn't the structure that was a problem. I totally believe that it was not the structure involved. It was just the time. And it was the sponsors doing things that buying at the top of the market, marking them up and selling. And that's what caused the problems. It's not the ownership structure. Right. Ticks have been around forever. I mean, any joint ownership historically, typically it's going to be a tick. In today's world where I see ticks used or value add situations where you're going, buying something, the, the sponsor's buying something they want to fix in turn, it gives you the ability to do that stuff where typically a DST is not going to be that. DST is going to be a going concern. A uh, tick is a s- single asset. DSTs can be a single asset or they could be a dozen different assets. Multiples. It really doesn't matter. So once again, if you're looking at making money through a value add type situation, you're looking mm-hmm. at a tick vehicle. If you're looking at uh, just a great solid passive investment, the DST is going to be the bulk of that market. Ticks got sort of a black eye the last crash. A lot of people say, oh, you don't want to buy a tick. They're horrible. Blah, blah, blah. Well, like I said, it wasn't. it's not the structure. It's, mm-hmm. it's those sponsors. And I would caution anybody today, anytime you're working with somebody else, you've got to look at what you're buying and the, the investment's only as good as the sponsor, right? You've got to make sure you're working with somebody that's going to be there after this fiasco is over. Right. Uh, don't, don't just buy something based upon the return. I mean, so many times people just look at, well, gee, this guy's going to pay me 8 or 10, and this one's paying me 6, 5 to 6. Sure. I'm going to go for the 8 or 10. Well, risk and reward, right? So you've got to look at this stuff. And uh, my advice is if you're going into any of these institutionalized investments, work with somebody that was there before the last crash. They've been through it before. Mm -hmm. Odds are they're going to be through it again. And and if it's somebody that's just getting into this thing, I would really take a 
diligent deep dive on everything make sure it's good good and so also I know um, with the DSTs that because it could be one or multiple properties that are within that DST realm um, is it true that you have to also file a tax return where that property is held yeah. so not only if I'm you know living here in Oregon and I buy a DST in Minnesota I have now need to file that return as well. For, for years, and it's a great question because it brings up a, an issue that is very, very misunderstood, I think. Uh, and, and some of the time, so years ago we used to hear ads, start a Nevada limited liability company mm -hmm. because there's no state tax, right? And everybody thinks, gee, I want to have it there because I'm not going to have to pay any. So I do the LLC in Nevada and I'll go buy in California and I get away from that. No, you don't. It's where the investment is. So you're going to file a return anywhere you've got investment income. So these things, if you're looking at a DST, if it's, if it's somebody that, that doesn't really do a lot of that, they might mm -hmm. put a DST together with 10 properties in 10 different states going to cost a little bit of money just to do the tax work. Yes. If, if uh, you're working with somebody that understands this stuff, uh, the, the major sponsors, they've been around the block. They understand. And if they're going to put multi-asset DST offering together, typically they're going to try to do it and, mm -hmm. and minimize the number of states that it's going to overlap on. But, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing. That's one of those situations where, gee, you know, hey, if I, if I live in Florida and I've got an investment in Cali, I don't need to worry about sure. it. No, that's, you know, where you're making the money. So Right. Just more things to think about yep. as we go through with our investments and, and to keep on the back of our mind. And so with that, um, also, I think about additional costs that we may incur moving forward. Is there anything else that... Uh, folks would need to think about in that scenario? Well, I think we have to go back once again to the last crash. Mm -hmm. Okay, so whoever you're buying from or buying with, I mean, you've got, if you're an owner of an asset, you have, obviously you're concerned about what you're making, but you've got to look sure. at that other side. What's the, what's the flip side? What could potentially be a problem? Sure. Does that sponsor have the right to come back to you mm -hmm. to save a property? You know, I mean, and, and that's where the issues come up. During the last crash, we did see capital calls on some of the, you know, the, the tick offerings and different things were going. Uh, you know, the biggest sponsors, the busiest ones, I, I, you know, they pretty much got through everything without any issues along those lines. But yeah, you need to be careful if you're, if you're buying into some, understand what you're on the hook for. Most of the time, if we're looking DST stuff, it's all non-recourse debt. So you've right. got a problem with a property, the property went away for some reason, at least it's not going to destroy your credit. Mm -hmm. And and that's where that last crash, we did a lot of, uh, you know, phantom gain exchanges. Uh, sure. Phantom gain exchange, for those of you out there, would be a situation where people think they have to have a profit on a property to have gain. And that's totally untrue. Phantom gain is a situation where if the debt exceeds the basis on a property in a foreclosure short sale, the debt's going to be treated as a sales price and you're going to have gain even though you lost a property or sold it via short sale. Right. So that's one of those things on a primary residence, you had tax relief on income properties you didn't. So it's really important to understand where you're sitting with those things. But in those situations where we had to deal with those properties, at least it didn't destroy the person's credit. So they were able to, a situation where the phantom gain is you lose the asset, you're going to pay tax, you got to, you know, the, the pleasure of losing a property, paying tax to lose it, or you come out of pocket roughly what you would have lost to tax to go complete an exchange, and at least you didn't lose all that and have to pay the tax. So that's a situation where I hope, I really hope we don't get there this time, but you know, what? it depends. Yeah, if the if the banks open up, the banks, you know, how, how come they got a drop of how many basis points, and yet their borrowing rates increased? I mean, it's ridiculous. So, so yeah, I mean, we hope we don't get that place. Mm -hmm. uh, I my advice: passive investments. These things. A lot of times, people say, "Well, you're giving your money somebody else to manage." But if you're dealing with one of these major sponsors that's been doing doing this for twenty years, they have thirty the years. Knowledge. Yeah, they have the knowledge. They've got the pockets to deal with it. And, and my advice is just talk to the sponsors you're working, looking to work with and see how they addressed the last crash, see what's going on this time and how they're doing. Perfect. Thank you so much sure. for answering the questions. And again, thank you for watching our video. David Moore, Tina Colson, Equity Advantage, 1031exchange.com. Again, free consultations. Call us up. 
ask us and um, we're happy to help you out with any questions that you may have. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Bye-bye.